welcome at the Go Beyond series where we discuss the most important trends that we see in the e-commerce world and hear from the innovators who are moving with them. Today we're going to talk about an omni-channel customer experience. The, uh, the concept of omnichannel retail is not a new one. It's been around for over a decade now. In 2011, an article appeared uh, in the Harvard Business Review titled The Future of Shopping, in which Daryl Rigby, a partner at Bain and Company, coined the phrase omnichannel retailing, defining as retailers will be able to interact with customers through countless channels, websites, physical stores, kiosks, direct mail and catalogs, call centers, social media, mobile devices, gaming consoles, televisions, network appliances, home services and lots of more. Ten years on the concept has only grown in importance as the physical and digital retail landscapes continue to merge and mutate with customers uh, expecting frictionless and relevant experience from the brands and businesses that they interact with. So what does an omnichannel customer experience look lo like in 2022? And how can businesses leverage this into increased customer value? Today we will discuss this and more with a panel of experts uh, from some industry leaders and innovators from the world of consulting, logistics and fashion. And you're about to meet four incredible guests at the table. We have Koen Lesage, Director of Digital Commerce at Deloitte. Welcome. Thank you. And always uh, on top of the latest trends of e-commerce, uh, I've heard. We try to be, yes. <laughs> And uh, we have also uh, physically here Jan Cardinaals, CEO and co-founder of Yitzi. Also welcome. Um, you're the leading brand in trials uh, for apparel uh, parts and accessories, a, a, new, a newbie in, in Omnichannel. Absolutely. Um, and we have later in this uh, session also from Italy, Vincenzo Troia. He is uh, from Giglio, the managing director. He's calling in later. Um, he's, that's a, a famous Italian high fashion brand and very experienced in omnichannel um, and we also have Sylvie van den Kerkhoff uh, also dialing in Sylvie uh, welcome you're the vice president of marketing at UPS nice to have you here thank you nice to be here as well Koen, uh, let's start with you. At Deloitte, uh, you help businesses devise and execute uh, uh, e-commerce strategies every day. Uh, let's start with the definition of an omni-channel and how does it differ with a multi-channel? Okay, um, good question. I mean, if you look at, at you know, what we've been through the last, I would say, 20 years, we all come from physical stores, we've seen e-commerce come on, and now we, we have that, you know, e-commerce, connecting physical stores, we get to omni-channel and people are looking at us like, you know, how do we handle this? Mm -hmm. One of the responses we typically ask them as and talk to clients is, you know, what does omni-channel mean for you? Where are you now? Where do you think you're missing? Which channels do you have? Which don't you have? And then you try to come up with what brings value for your customers. And that's that's very often... I would say overlooked by companies because they feel we need to be everywhere. And if we're everywhere, it's fine, but it's actually limited. If you look at whether it's B2C, B2B, whether it's in fashion, whether it's in, in, in food retail, it's, it's a different answer. Yeah. It's never going to be the same. Omnichannel is not just a, this is it. And once I'm there, it's done. No, it's evolving. We're, we're in the middle of it still, although it's been 10 years and everybody agrees and we're applying it, we're still in the middle of defining what it will be. So you have companies who are okay with a, a small omni-channel maybe, and there are companies with a big omni-channel and maybe endless omni-channel. Yes, endless you'll, you'll find companies that will say we have two channels and they support each other and our clients know us of those two channels and they will jump from one to the other and it's fine. You'll have others that have, I don't know, 20 different channels and they will track a client across all 20. And, and typically there, if you look at the company sitting behind that, is if you have a multi-brand, multi-value product company, it's a completely different omni-channel. So you really need to look at what our clients expecting from you mm -hmm. compared to what am I willing to invest to be there? I mean, where, how far and how long do I want to invest in something like this? Yes. And uh, how have omni-channel strategies developed over recent years? And, and what does a successful strategy look like today? 
The last one is a difficult one. If I yeah. figure that one out, I will is let you know. Is there a successful strategy? With us as well? <laughs> there's, there's definitely, there's definitely been very large successes. If if you look at some of the of the major fashion brands you have, they've they've connected with you know Ch Snapchat. They've they've implemented augmented reality. They've they've pulled everything together into one experience, and it works. Did they devise that up front and knew for sure this will work? No, I think a lot of testing and failing fast, the whole, I'm not going to go into agile, but the methodology, methodology of, you know, we'll test with our clients, we'll see if they pick it up and, and mm -hmm. they want to follow us. I would say, if you ask me, devise my strategy, I would first come back and say, okay, but what do you know from your clients and what can we leverage to then say, I believe you should test this, this, and this channel on this and this product, and then basically start building the strategy while you go, which is also the challenge. Because I cannot give you an upfront, this will work for sure, do it, and it's fine. It's the, much more a build and learn and learn quickly and grow with your customer base. If you educate your customers on stuff that you do, take a television ad, you scan the ad, will take you to the shop. If you start doing that and you see it picks up, Zalando tried that over the years, you know, we're trying some stuff and you can you can send it back for free and then now they're turning that back again and they're saying, hey, we need money if you want to send it back just to that's that type of learning and trying that should be your, you know, my omni channel vision. It needs to be omni channel. But which yeah. channels do I need? Where should I be present and where do I want to go fast? Where can I wait? Yeah. That's a difficult but one. But maybe then then the definition is that you're never there, there's never an end. Always stay awake until we get to the next step, which I think nobody knows. It's the ecosystem. It's you know what's next. Mm -hmm. Then looking back, we're probably going to say omnichannel was this, this, and that. Right now, omnichannel is try all the channels you need to, to mm, get yeah. that market open to get to reach those clients. But it's it's evolving that fast. We're going from B2C, B2B to B2B to C, D to C, whatever combination you want to have on all the possibilities you have to reach mm -hmm. a client that right now saying this is what you need to do. And do do you have maybe one. some some good examples of, of companies from which you think they make good combinations, they understand what they're doing? I take uh, take your typically uh, a Nike, an Adidas, uh, a L'Oreal, they... You know, they go far. They follow their clients. They build a brand. They make it immersive. People, you know, they want to be part of. And somewhere in there, there's that transaction and, you know, buy the product. And Coca-Cola is is has been doing that for years. And and I think to a large extent, they're very successful in their omni-channel. But I'm wondering if you would ask them the, the question, like, are you there? Have you reached it? They're probably going to say, no, we're still... We're still finding other channels. We're still finding combination of channels that yes. will work. Yes. I think that's a... Uh, and uh, someone who's also searching for the best combination, <laughs> Jan. Uh, Jan, you started uh, in retail in 2019 and, and launched your website as well. Uh, nowadays, your products can be found in 400 stores, I mm -hmm. heard. Right. And consumers in over 46 countries can order your products online. Uh, what is your omni-channel strategy? Oh, well, at this moment in time, we're really into a multi-channel strategy and we're trying to make the most of that one. But for over the last two, three years, when we started to do the B2C website and going direct to the consumer, we've started to apply some bits of that uh, multi-channel or that omni-channel, uh, trying to connect a lot more with the, the final consumer instead of the, the B2B customer. So we've tried to apply a lot of, uh, of the strategy into going to more to social media, Mm -hmm. being more active at events and trying to connect a lot more with those consumers who are actually buying our product. Before, all the information that we were getting was through importers, distributors, dealers. Yeah. And all the information from the, the, the public was filtered through all of those channels. Mm -hmm. What we've learned recently over the last two, three years is that what the market actually tells you, the only way to really grasp that is to be in direct contact with them. Yes. And in our business, we're in the sports business, so we share a passion with the consumers. So that makes a really easy connection point with them, talking about that passion all the time. And so do you see a growth when you, you more work with Omnichannel? 
Oh, absolutely. It's actually proven to be very uh, successful, not only for us, but also mm -hmm. for our B2B customers, because those B2, uh, B2B customers who have given us actually the trust to do what we're doing, they've actually been very profitable because we're driving part of the business from the retail to them. Mm -hmm. We're actually pre-selling everything to them. For sure, we're trying to take a small part of that market to us, mm -hmm. but it's actually allowed us to limit the amount of dealerships that we have all over the world, mm -hmm. but to really connect with the retail public and those dealers because they know that we have a, we have a strategy to work together and not against each other, which is part of the omni channel that we're trying to develop with them and to, to find our place, their place, and that retail public, yes. that, that place that they, they need to have as well. So that's also omni-channel, work with the dealers. For sure. I mean, it's like, like Jan said, it's a balancing act. Huh? It's, it's on one hand, you're evangelizing your brand building. You could say, I'm not going to go transactional on that side. I'm just going to, you know, educate the public and then drive them to my retailers who then will come back to me. Mm. Yes. But on the other by selling directly, you learn what the customer wants. You learn what the market wants. You learn how that side of the business works. And that you can then go back to the business say it's not only about, you know, lever uh, evangelizing. It's also about, hey, this works, this works, and this works. If I'm a dealer and you come to me and you say, in your geography, this product will work because of all the knowledge I have, mm -hmm. you should be buying this and this and this for me, then yes, I'll be listening. Yes. And that's part of that omni-channel. Yes. Yeah, continuously learning and and do a good survey also. Yeah, uh, and um, mm. what roles do your different channels play in your strategy? Oh well, again, being in a sports business and using social media as much as we can do, it's a very direct line to to the retail public to share a lot of stuff directly from us as a brand with them. So social media has played a big part. Uh, going direct on the on the website uh, we're actually at the mo at this moment in time also starting a club where we actually try to give the next level experience to retail consumers uh, to connect with us yes so this is very important that we make a, a special effort to educate them to give them inside knowledge to actually almost invite them over with us and say look guys this is who we are mm -hmm. and we want you to be involved with us so that's 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 part of the, what we're trying to do. On the other end, like your standard channels, being at events, for example, is also a very powerful uh, channel because you meet people. The big difference now is that maybe previously we were just present and just being there. Yeah. Now with Omnichannel, with having a strategy, you are there and you're trying to make really yes. something out of it. Not just being there, but getting the data from them, talking to them and actually pretty much doing those pre-sales again at an event and then making sure like, okay, we're here. You can, you can be sure we're going to be at the next one as well, trying to create consistency. So you can let them interact also with each it's other. Just not, uh, it's just not, it, only channel to me isn't really something that you do once or a, a few times. It's consistency. And again, like let's, let's, what's been said here is it's something that takes a lot of effort. You're going to have some wins, you're going to have some failures and you just got to cherry pick a little bit what's going to work for you and you know, amplify that all over the time. Yes. That's what I uh, believe in Omnichannel is what we're trying to do. Um, I think he's doing great already. Yeah, but you need to keep on, even if you have channels where, you know, you test, it doesn't work, you come back and you say, you have to retest it at some point again. Absolutely. Because your audience change. And at some point you need and to technology. say, yeah, 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 yeah. And you need to go back and say, you know, this works, we've tested this, we'll, we'll retest it a year later, two years later, and it might just be working. And that's, that's where you need to keep on trying to, am I omni-channel? I think if you keep on trying and keep on evaluating yourself and how you handle all those channels, and then yes, to, to a large extent, you're there. Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah. Um, we also have with us, uh, in the meantime, Vincenzo Troia. He's uh, uh, an ex very experienced you. in, uh, in omni-channel. <laughs> Vincenzo, welcome. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, Vincenzo, um, the first Giglio shop uh, opened in the 60s and your website launched in 1996. So you've had quite some experience in, in balancing your physical and digital channels since then. Uh, what lessons did you learn in terms of developing an omni-channel strategy? 
Yeah, exactly. That's the long story of a family uh, in Palermo, in Sicily. The, the first store was opened several decades ago, and already in the 96, there was a dot com. At that time, Amazon was just sending the first books, and actually, Ups or went up. Actually, Netaporter was not even created. So it was an intuition of going online that was actually forward compared to also the, um, let's say, contest of a Sicilian business that is usually actually an economy that is pretty basic compared to the, the rest of Europe. So these founders had actually the intuition of going online and it has been perceived pursued for uh, so many years. And now, actually, uh, the website of the of the store became something bigger and actually more complex than a simply online channel of the physical stores. Now, geo.com is a marketplace. It's not just our stores on it. It's 162 uh, stores around Europe on wow. it. Wow. Uh, which means that actually it's more than an omnichannel. It became an omnichannel experience for more than one um, company, more than the Geo family. It's actually a, a, omni, a digital channel for many of stores that doesn't have the power to uh, actually go online with their own uh, website. So this is a uh, long story short, the story, the history of this, uh, of this business. Uh, which was listed recently uh, in uh, the stock exchange in Italy and is compared to Farfetch for the ones of you that are actually similar with, uh, familiar with the business model. So what Omnichannel meant for this business was actually uh, developing something that was actually, let's say, learned in the streets. So being able to learn the consumer to learn what the consumer wants, especially actually uh, the local consumer was actually the secret to understand the consumer online and never losing actually the contacts with, uh, with people. And that's why actually the store is actually uh, as a huge clientele, especially in the South of Europe, because there's been a contact and a constant learning from the offline world in the yeah. online world because the the business never lost contact actually with the consumer with the yes please yes um so um can you tell more about how how do they interact with each other the different channels then it's first of all it's about learning so our buyers uh, on the store are learning from the uh, online purchases also placed abroad and in the other regions of Italy, for instance. So it's a constant learning. The online website actually is learning because it's never losing contact with the consumer, the physical consumer, and actually the buyers of the physical stores are learning in advance what's happening in Paris or London. Yes. So definitely it's a constant trading of uh, information. Uh, that's as a first uh, first aspect. And then it's also about, um, let's say, um, experience also of the consumer that can actually also go offline and shop uh, offline exactly what it can be found online. Uh, because we have also digital panels where they can find actually in the boutiques, in the stores, what it's actually provided eventually by other stores. So physically sp still plays an important role uh, in the omnichannel. Definitely. Definitely. And the consumer here in Sicily can actually serve the uh, tablets and actually purchase from a store in Milan or Paris and it will be delivered directly in their place in case that specific item is not available in our store. So we are kind of bringing the marketplace that is purely online. We are bringing it also in our physical store, allowing people to access stock and catalog from all over Europe. 
Yeah. And uh, Sylvie, uh, uh, you also did a, a survey about this. Do you also see this, that physically, uh, s physical s also s still plays an important role in the Omnichannel? Yeah, it does indeed. Um, I, I would say we have two studies that I would like to reference. Uh, first of all, if we look at uh, market forecasts for 2022, e-commerce is expected to make up 21% of total retail sales worldwide. Um, that's an uptick from 20% in 2021, but that still means that 79% uh, of retail sales happens in stores. So physical is, is still very important. Uh, with the exception of UK, the number is, is even bigger in uh, Europe's major markets. Uh, Omnichannel is all about uh, consumers being able to interact with businesses, right? Wherever and whenever they want. Uh, so it's really important uh, that, uh, that we have a consistent experience offline and online. Uh, and that also thanks for logistics from a standpoint of where people want to ship and return goods. Um, so they want that flexibility. And as you said, we did uh, do a consumer research uh, across Europe's top eight markets. And the majority of the respondents actually, um, they indicated that they would balance offline and online uh, shopping, uh, even post pandemic, rather than prioritizing one over the other. Uh, so we do see that, of course, the pandemic boosted uh, shifts to digital commerce especially in markets where we were lagging behind, but it also reminded customers that they love shopping mm -hmm. and they love to go in person. <laughs> um, some of the main benefits that they indicate is uh, that they enjoyed the in-store shopping. Uh, the perception that the in-store shopping is actually more personalized and also returning items in the store is easier. Yes. Uh, so there is uh, that indication that actually these uh, retailers, the physical stores, they really need to work on an omni-channel strategy and, um, and look at all the different channels and how they can incorporate that to give a good offline and online experience. Yes. And uh, uh, Koen, uh, uh, how is the physical part of the omni-channel equation evolving? Uh, um, evolving? Uh, what role does it still play? I would say it, it's it's definitely a different role than before, huh? but one of the one of the main reasons why it's still there, why do people still stand in line at a, an Apple shop when there's yeah. an iPhone, is is that product gratification? Huh? They buy it, they get it, they will you know walk out the store and say, "I have it." Yeah, that's maybe a challenge UPS can can solve in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, when you you know by the time I walk out of the store, there's a yes. UPS guy giving me the like phone. I and buy now and then whop with voilà. someone stands home. But that is, hey, that is for sure key why the, the physical side of things is not going to disappear. Oh. The other one is is still that trust. Still, you know, I can hold it. I can look at it. I can, and, 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 you know. But does it differ also from a, a, a fashion? Is, is maybe uh, more a thing to, to buy physical because you can fit it then? Uh, you it's maybe different than... than you yeah. have solutions where with augmented reality, you will see the dress, you will see the suit. You, you know, you could say, I've seen it, it looks good, I'll buy it. But I, like it was mentioned, I mean, people still want to spend time in a place where they can find their product. Mm -hmm. What is changing is that it used to be, I have a store with products and that's fine. Mm -hmm. Now you walk in and you expect a an experience. Again, that omni-channel. If I walk into an, app, uh, an Apple store and it's not the More typical like white thingy, it's it's just, you know, it's, it's an experience with products. Yes. Even I... Companies that not necessarily have a, a a sexy product know that you know if I if I build the experience and people walk in and they have that same experience over and over and over again they will come back. Mm. Restaurants, food chains, you see it. You know if if I travel, I go to Denmark, I go to the UK, I walk into the same restaurant, food chain, I'm expecting that same experience. Yes. That's also omni-channel. For me, that's that. It feels the same. So it kind of feels like. I've been here, I know what I'll get, I know how good it is, and I'm willing to pay for that. Yeah. Whether that's on a physical product or something else, it's it's that same thing again. And so the physical needs to evolve. If you take a, well, take a Decathlon, I mean, they have 
hundreds of products, but they're also evolving from a pure, their shopping lines and you pick what you need and you go and try to, oh, you can, you can sit on a saddle. It, the thing looks like a horse. So you can sit on it. You can, you can hit a golf ball. You can climb a wall. Yeah. You can, so th th they're also evolving. They know they need to evolve and people will come because they can try it. They can see it. And they have that gratification of, I get my product and I walk out. Yeah. And then if yeah, you and add... Also, I, I would say from a, a logistics point of view, there is a, a change in how physical locations are operating, right? I mean, you have that experience part, but then you also have uh, that some of those physical shops have repurposed uh, part of their uh, shop in order to become a fulfillment center. Uh, so you do have like click and collect that is growing in popularity, enabling consumers to collect uh, online orders. Um, one of the other things is that we are using, for example, physical locations as, as an access point. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, we will deliver the goods to a local supermarket or to a news agent where people can uh, collect or drop off shipments. So it actually creates for the shop owner, it creates additional foot traffic. I mean, they will come to that store to pick up their package, but then at the same time, maybe buy a newspaper or something else. Um, so it's, it's, it's that convenience of giving to customers uh, of, to choose where they want to collect their goods and where they want to pick it up. At the same time, it enables us to have deliveries done more sustainable from an environmental perspective. Uh, instead of delivering to the home. So um, it's all about uh, consumer choice and, and giving that different experiences uh, and, and giving different options to customers. Oh, you see this, uh, Vincenzo, if you hear this? Oh, yeah, it's definitely, I mean, uh, as previously, previously said, still three thirds or maybe 60% of the sales also in the future are going to be placed offline. So the stores are will continue to be crucial uh, on this, particularly for our business. Uh, if we refer to the geo stores, so in, uh, in CC, they are definitely uh, back to pre-pandemic level of sales. So they are definitely seeing this willingness of uh, shopping also offline on the brick and mortar of the, of the consumers. And also, of course, the offline stores have been benefiting from the awareness of the online, which was on TV, which was in, in uh, Billboard and so on. As I said previously, they are benefiting from the opportunity to surf on a tablet a catalog that is actually not available in store and get it delivered in their homes. And they are benefiting also from the access of brands that our buyers are buying because they see they are already bought in Paris and London. So people love it. And so that's how the actually physical store are benefiting from the online channels. And so they will still play a crucial role in the future. Yes. Um, and Kuhn, how are digital channels evolving as, as part of the omni-channel mix? Which digital channels are paramount to an omni-channel strategy in 2022, you think? Well, I think the, the first one, mobile, it's still increasing. Uh, Next generations, we still have laptops. Next generations will not know what a laptop is. They will, you know, they will live on mobile. They will only want to do mobile. It's not good for our eyes. Uh, that's uh, that's another somebody problem. else okay. who can sell you <laughs> eyewear. So that okay, kinda, we're not you know, going to talk about we'll, eyewear. No. <laughs> we'll find a solution there. No, but I definitely, definitely, mobile commerce is is one to stay and to grow. Yeah. Uh, if if you look at those experiences, there's still a lot of improvement to be made. Social commerce is, is upcoming, especially because if you look at growth in APEC countries on commerce, I mean, it's huge and it's still very much in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and their social commerce is what works because there's that trust level. They don't trust the big companies. They want, you know, they want to be in a group that sells them something. They can talk to people. They can discuss it. They, they will buy. So I, social commerce for sure. And then it's a bit guessing but everything that, that has to do with augmented reality, AI-driven analytics, offering you what you're looking for before you even know you're looking for it, that will drive it even further. So this is a bit, you know, will that work? Will AR make it into our homes and be, 
I easy enough and and limitless enough to use and you know I want to buy something new I'll just project it on the wall or take a picture and a new TV oh this is how it will look yeah will we make it will we bridge technology potentially yes will it be quick difficult to say what the effect will be from AI behind that that's still one I'm very interested to see there's definitely going to be an impact do you also have plans to work with this uh, <laughs> this channels Possibly, yeah. It, it, is, it sounds really interesting. Uh, I can totally imagine uh, talking about when you buy clothing, for example. Yeah. To actually see what you're buying on yourself when you're not even wearing it. Uh, just project it on yourself, size-wise and all that. That should be quite interesting. It's quite interesting as well to reduce all of the returns that you get because you get a lot better view of what you're actually buying. Um, it's just a pretty unknown yeah, part of the of yeah. the equation for us at this moment in time because it's it just still sounds so far away. Mm -hmm. um, coming back to the the point from the mobile side, that's absolutely something that we're seeing a lot, especially because people come to events and they see exactly what they're actually interested in in front of them. So finding a way for them to actually take a picture and actually see it at the event and being able to actually buy it and mm -hmm. even possibly at the end of the event picking it up. Sounds like something that yeah. is really interesting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that. I think that's not too far away. Huh? Yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm quite <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling though. quite triggered at the moment because <laughs> that that just popped something in my head. So it's like yeah, there's something in that that I haven't thought about. So yeah, there's there's just so much new stuff coming to all of us that. Yeah, and uh, uh, Vincenzo, uh, you you also heard the the, the channel, uh, the different channels, uh, also for two thousand and twenty two. Uh, uh, AI, is that something that's in your uh, your uh, on your agenda right now? Well, definitely, it's already in store. Uh, actually, some some functionalities are already launched. AI is already helping us, for instance, to predict people's sizes in order to minimize the return. Mm -hmm. We didn't launch yet a, a service of uh, a virtual try-on, which has been actually pretty exploited in the market uh, recently. Uh, by some of our competitors, uh, but it's actually needed to be proved to be uh, effective. It's not there, it's not happening actually in this moment. No one has actually found it really, really converting. So it's something that, as you previously said, we it's really evolving and no one has a precise key of what's going to, how to use the AI or, or what's going to, Mm -hmm. happen with uh, with that but definitely uh, it's helping somehow but it's still not the main driver at least for the yeah. fashion uh, consumers also uh, what uh, other services is that have been um, have been tried also uh, on top of the virtual virtual try on are for instance the image recognitions and some of our we have seen some of our competitors actually retrieve it because actually people was not using image recognition to find products on fashion stores so i think every industry has similar uh, similarities and differences right now the artificial intelligence is really helping is really happy but it's not key for the final purchase of the consumer it will surely be soon Yes. And, and uh, uh, Kuhn, how can businesses create a 360-degree view of their, their customer in, in order to execute uh, a truly omni-channel experience? What are the main obstacles to achieving this and, and how can they be overcome? I would say the main one, uh, GDPR-wise. What can you track, what can you not track and you know how can you leverage it? Other than that is, is a trying to get whatever data you can, even if it's anonymous, and try to get that switch with, okay, that's you. I recognize you. I recognize your pattern. I recognize what you're looking for so I can assist you. I think what to watch out is a bit is, is coming across as, as being intrusive. If you come across as, I know you, you need to have this, then probably I think a lot of customers will say, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're going too far. So it's finding that balance between I know you, I have enough data from you to actually help you. Mm -hmm. Like Vincenzo says, I know how, you know, I know your measurement, I know what you typically buy, I, I know your closet basically, and I know what will fit with the shoes you bought and so on. 
if you tell people that, they're probably going to say, ooh, no, too intrusive. <laughs> I don't want this. Let's go somewhere else. But if you find a very gentle way of telling them, yeah, you might want to consider this, then they might just go for or it. You, also, you have the choice to maybe... Uh, yes, and, and behind that is, I mean, company, siloed companies typically, you will have clients that buy on one side and get service from another, mm -hmm. and they will simply not reach each other. So as a client, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a manufacturer, if you cannot get across those silos, then you basically don't have a 360 view because your client might be complaining on one hand and might be stopped buying or slightly less buying on the other, and you want to get that together. Yeah. That's, that's for sure a risk. I, that's, that's definitely a step you need to take and get across. A customer is a customer. And I want to see everything. I want to know everything. And I want to act on everything. And then you can truly say, I have a 360 view. And that's, that's a difficult one. Because there are different teams, different business units, different ways of remuneration and so on. And, and I, that's, that's, for me, I would say the key one. And then you, you can still you know, dive into, but what channel gets what part of the remuneration? Mm -hmm. Because I made a sale. But it's not going to be one channel that sells. It's going to be all of them that sell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do I then, then they don't get anything and that one gets it all. Yeah, no, that's not true. But the company should get it all. Yes. And then, then you start to get in a whole other debate. Do you have something to add to this? Yeah, I, think <laughs> I think it's super interesting because what you're actually saying, or how do I understand that, is that we've been doing e-commerce and we've, we have an account for every consumer who makes an account. Mm -hmm. So you basically got a few basic details like his address, uh, an email address, of course. Now the next step for us is to understand actually what type of sport does he like? Like, does he like a motorcycle? Does he like a bicycle? Does he like a new bike? Does he like an old bike? And f step by step, trying to learn that from him and actually starting to use that information, maybe to our benefit, but definitely also to his, is quite challenging. Mm -hmm. Is how far can we take it? Uh, I can totally imagine, for example, if somebody purchases a, a new motorcycle, that in six months' time, you ask him, are you actually thinking about buying something new? Mm -hmm. Or is that crossed your mind already? Or actually, do you have children? Are those children interested as well? So how far can we take that? And yeah. that's, that is quite challenging. It's, that's really knowing your customer, huh? Yes. <laughs> and then, but and what you mentioned is all on customer side. But has there been a complaint? Did, they, did that client call us? Did the customer call in to ask a question? That's then that part of 360 that you also need to add. That's very the, tricky because our communication, we prefer to have that communication online with the consumer as much as we possibly can because that's easier to track for mm -hmm. sure. Yep. And when they start calling in and start complaining or, or putting notes out, that makes it a lot more challenging, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think we've been doing that, to be honest, but I wouldn't really 100% say, yeah, we absolutely always do that, but it definitely needs to take a, mm. We need to take a look at that, absolutely, yeah. or everyone should actually. Yeah, and typically then uh, you see clients, you know, open up and say, I have this portal and you can see everything I've been doing with you on the portal. Giving that transparency also means that you build the trust and they will come back and say, but this, this and that, I want you to forget, but I can give you this, this yeah. and that. And that's that, like you mentioned, the journey to how far can I take this? You know, how how much you know leverage I have on the relationship to say you should do this. It's also quite mm -hmm. challenging from our point of view is when you talk about passion and all that, is when does the passion just keeps just stays a passion and when does it get business? Because with a consumer, you at some point you need to yeah, convert yeah. them into a, a, a buyer and not just a fan. No. Yeah. Or, and that's also quite challenging. So how far you can take that? Mm. The fan is not, is, is good for your business, but <laughs> it's better to make him a buyer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A returning yeah. buyer fan. That's yes. absolutely something that you a need to A returning buyer fan. Yes. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're almost at the end of this session, but I have one very important question. I think the, the, yeah, the most important question, uh, Sylvia, I want to start with you. How does an omni-channel experience create more valuable customers? Yeah, I would say um, you 
uh, you give actually the opportunity for customers to to interact with your business uh, through their favorite methods, right? Uh, they can shop online, in store. They can phone you. They can do live chat. Um, so it's really uh, directed to their personal needs. Uh, for example, if if a if a customer comes in into a store, wants to uh, to buy a product that they've seen on their app, they can show it to to the in-store personnel, etc. I think one of the important items there is to really give a consistent experience, right, uh, to customers. Um, I think we've seen that very often that customers come in and say, hey, I can get your product cheaper uh, somewhere else. And yeah. uh, that that's an important point to make, that you really need to manage all these channels and make sure that you make it consistent for the customer. Uh, But I would say that once you do that, um, really creating a a very good omni-channel experience will actually boost your brand loyalty Um, because you see that a customer that interacts with you through various channels is more likely to come back and to to shop again. Uh, That's that's been found in studies. I think one of the the studies from from Harvard Business Review, as an example, shows that uh, people that uh, do omnichannel for av- on average spend four percent more in store and ten percent more online. So really combining uh, the channels and and having those different touch points with the customers is valuable yeah. for businesses. Vincenzo, do you have something to add to this? No, absolutely, I 100% in agreement. Indeed, all, uh, already in the online uh, um, operations, a consumer that is engaged uh, in more touch points, for instance, email, SMS, uh, uh, in-app notification, and so on, it's much more profitable than a consumer that is engaged only with one channel. The more the uh, experience is truly engagement uh, and multi touch points the more the consumer is going to be uh, engaged and that's the same with the offline interaction so of course if the consumer can enjoy it on top of the, of the touch points also additional services what's it, it's already happening online when we have a consumer that is engaged with three touch points, usually the yearly spending is at least doubles compared to the others that are engaged all with one. Same with the offline words, the spending. And so the profitability of the same consumer is going to be catalyzed because of the same reasons he was explaining. Yes. Um, and do you have something to add to this? No, Last? really, just just confirming. Yeah, I mean, we we done we've done. We the told study. everything, we, I think. We've done the yeah. studies. Eh? I yes. mean, an omnichannel customer has the loyalty. It's it's a fifty percent more value of an omnichannel customer compared to a non omnichannel. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's a, it's definitely something you want to have. Eh? Yeah, Ian Ab- agrees. I think. <laughs> <He's> saying, <yes. laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. This. True. Yeah. True. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, with this, we've come to an end uh, of this third episode of the Go Beyond series. Uh, I would like to like to thank you, uh, all of you, uh, Sylvie, Vincenzo, Jan, and also uh, I would like to thank you um, for being here uh, today, uh, Kuhn. And um, I would also like to thank you for watching the third episode of the Go Beyond series. Uh, I would say have a nice day. Ooh.